Hello everyone, and welcome to Through Time and Clades. My name is Joan. And I'm Albert. Oh, uh, and today we have a great episode for y'all. Uh, this is part five of our Human Evolution series, Humanity a Prologue. And uh, today's episode is called Yes Homo, which is a uh, reference to a popular internet humor, if you will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about the first humans. But uh, I'll, I'll mention what that means in a moment. But uh, first things first, how are you doing, Albert? Pretty good, yeah. Um, still still working on my research, I guess, uh, making incremental progress. But um, you know, I, I'm not so, um, so plagued by deadlines this past couple of weeks, so it's been pretty good, I suppose. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, things have been going well on my end. Um, that's good. I finally started listening to um, the Amoeba People podcast the other oh, day. Oh, that's a fun one. I Because uh, I had asked you about it, Albert, and uh, I decided to just go ahead and start on the um, the second season, which is the, mm. the, the serial, I guess, that they're doing. Right. And, oh my gosh, yeah, they're, they're funny. I, I love the humor, <laughs> I love the scenario, first off, and uh, the in-jokes. Um, so I feel it's, like I'm going to really look forward to this one. It's pretty amusing, yeah. Because <laughs> I know the whole first season, you said, are... Um, interviews with researchers and right. yep. mm -hmm. they talked to a couple familiar names that we all mm -hmm. know about so uh, I'm gonna have to check those out too for sure yeah but uh, otherwise things are good things are normal with me um, good. yeah so uh, before we jump into the episode uh, I do have some important updates to the series as a whole mm -hmm. that I would like to share so let's go ahead and dive in to the first slide here uh, so the image on the left requires a bit of backstory. So basically, we had just finished recording this, you know, on Thursdays as we do, and uh, like the episode four of the series on Australopithecines, and you know, we uploaded it, and uh, it was like the day. It was like the day that we uploaded it. I'm, I'm scrolling through Twitter as I usually do, and I see. Uh, a link to a new story about a scientific paper, you know, complete skull of Australopithecus anamensis found. Mm. And I'm like, oh shit, that's awesome. I, uh, they, they finally found some good cranial material. I'm looking at the photos and as you can see here, it, it's spectacular. This is... Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, this is more than we could have hoped for. Right. And then I look at the date of the article. August 2019. <laughs> and I'm like... Wait, <laughs> yeah. we we had this the whole time, and I didn't know about it. I even looked on Wikipedia, and sure enough, they mentioned it. The new skull that was found, I'm like, I, I was just on that page. How did I miss this? <laughs> oh. But, uh, you know, uh, it's a pretty large subject, paleoanthropology, and there's always yeah. a study here and there that's being done. I, it, No one person can comprehend the entire thing. And, right. and, and know every single study. You can try, but it's not gonna. It's not gonna be successful, apparently. <laughs> as, as, right. as, I'm, as I'm finding, I'm learning as I make this. Um, <laughs> but it's all good. I'm here to to talk about it now. So uh, the, the the long and short of it is, you know, this new cranium basically adds to a growing consensus regarding the nature of this particular hominin and its relation to us. Uh, well, for starters, this new cranium dates to 3.8 million years ago, which effectively pushes forward the time span for Anamensis by roughly 100,000 years. Uh, not, not too unexpected there. Uh, then we have the matters of the anatomy of the skull. Uh, it has a you know, smaller brain case and a much more prognathic face than many of the later Australopithecines, while still sharing similarities in the proportions of the face and the shape of the size of teeth to the species that we know about. Uh, phylogenetically, it can be further clarified that Anamensis does appear to sit at a midway branching point between early hominins like Artipithecus and later Australopithecines like hmm. Praeanthropus afarensis, you know, which is a species that might be contemporaneous with Anamensis should there be older fossils found. Um, there's a... Uh, often a lot of talk among certain researchers of what they call anagenesis in mm. this particular part of the tree where 
it's argued that anamensis like evolved into afarensis. Now, of course, we can't know that for sure, so I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of those claims, but I think the phylogenetic closeness of these two, at least, is particularly telling. And uh, they probably wouldn't have looked very different from each other. So there's that. Um, but no, it, it, this skull is pretty exciting. You know, we, we can finally give a full head and face to Anamensis. Yeah. Um, so I look forward to seeing this covered more and more in the popular literature. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, the last discovery here on the right, uh, this is more like a news update than anything. You know, this was described in the time between the airing of these two episodes. So this is actually brand new. Um, some of y'all may have even seen this here and there on, on social media. Hmm. Basically, what we have is a new, really well-preserved skull for Paranthropus robustus. Now, this individual lived between 2.4 and 1.95 million years ago, and is technically called DNH-155. The site of discovery is called Drimolin, where other members of the species have been found. Now, what's particularly fascinating about this new skull is that it really challenges our understanding of the sexual anatomy in Paranthropus. Now, the main consensus regarding this particular lineage of hominins is that there was very pronounced sexual dimorphism, with biological males being larger than females, and with uh, unique skull characters in both of these sexes. Now, when this skull was found, you know these features screamed, oh, this is a male robustus, and yet the size of the skull was more like that of a female. Now, when males from a neighboring site called Swartkrins, and I'm sure I'm probably butchering that name, uh, when those are thrown into the mix, they're actually larger than this skull right here. Hmm. And this led the authors of the paper to suggest that we might have to consider thinking about marked regional variation within the species, with the individuals at Drimelin bearing distinctions from those at Swartkrins. So rather than being this one-size-fits-all approach to giving a sex to robustus remains, now we have to take into account the location of the remains too. And uh, here's the real kicker. Since this skull and other remains from Drimelin are dated from a much older time than the Swartkin's remains, that means that there's a high probability that this, the species Paranthropus robustus itself underwent an evolutionary change in sexual dimensions over the following 200,000 years from the Drimelin remains. Wow. Now, like that, that sounds like a, a short period of time, but as far as hominins are concerned, that's, that's very, yeah. fairly normal. <laughs> right, um, right. Uh, the authors go further to argue that you know, this change may have been facilitated by climatic events in eastern Africa. You know, the gradual drying of the environment would have pushed Paranthropus robustus to develop larger bodies and thus larger jaws and teeth in order to handle more of the grassy diet, which is typical of this lineage. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it, I think it just goes to show uh, that human, and then to an extent hominin diversity in shape and size and sex, is really high, you know, through time as well as in the present. Mm-hmm. And we really need to keep that in mind when we're studying the evolution of our lineage. Um, that, that seems to be quite the theme here on this series, eh, Albert? Right. <laughs> well then, uh, let's go ahead and jump back into the main story. And uh, today, as you may have seen, we're going to investigate the early history of the genus Homo. So let's go to the next slide here. So right out the gate, it needs to be said that the genus Homo has never been properly defined in a modern scientific context. Hmm. When Linnaeus coined that name in 1758 in Systema Notore, he took a very unconventional approach to humankind that he did not use for every other animal and plant that he named, <laughs> you know, rather than specific anatomical characters, all Linnaeus offered to identify a member of the genus Homo is to, and I quote, know thyself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is to say, you know who you are and you're a human. That's it. <laughs> you know, we, we, are, we are so plentiful and so knowledgeable about ourselves that You know, he didn't even need to bother to offer a type specimen for our species, Mm. you know, which is a specific individual, by the way, for which other remains can be compared. 
Mm-hmm. So we have these in for living species as well as fossil remains. Uh, I know it's been argued that Linnaeus himself could be considered the human type specimen right. since he was the one to kind of give us our name and I guess it's kind of fitting. But uh, I don't think the Uppsala Cathedral in Sweden is just going to let any student of anthropology walk in and use his bones for <laughs> <laughs> analyses. So, uh, you know, re- rest assured, Linnaeus was at least fair in one respect. You know, yeah, there are many humans in the world today. And, you know, we have more than enough remains to recognize a member of Homo sapiens. Mm-hmm. Um, but what about the other fossil species that we've since discovered? You know, what sort of reference do we have for them? You know, what makes a member of the genus Homo as opposed to the other hominins like Paranthropus? Well, before we jump into that question, I should make note that from this moment on, any and all members of the genus Homo will be referred to as humans. True humans, that is. Um, this might sound like a weird question, but etymology-wise, there actually has been a bit of discourse regarding what to call a human in the clade hominina. So some researchers re- reserve the term human for the whole of the group. Mm-hmm. So Australopithecines, Ardipithecus, Sahelanthropus, those are all humans. And others will restrict human to a very narrow definition so for Homo sapiens only. So, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, and so on, not human. Now, a a sizable number have argued, and I think argue very strongly, that the term human should be less broad than hominina, but also less specific than Homo sapiens, Hmm. reserving it just for this particular genus. And uh, I tend to agree with this. Uh, Albert, I don't know about you. Um... Well, I, I I like crown group definitions, but I, I can see why that you would consider this entire group to to be uh, humans. Um, it's a uh, it's I guess it's it's kind of one of those you you know it when you see it things right it's like, right uh, it, right like they 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 seem to share enough similarities in this common group to yeah that if you if you saw one of these today you would consider all of them to be human basically. Right, right. Um, yeah, it, it's it, that is a good question to think about. You know, it's like if Linnaeus had seen Australopithecines, you know, right. would he have put them in Homo with us, or would he have put them in the the Simia genus, which he lumped all the other primates, you know, not including bats and colugos, mm. into? Um, now, of course, uh, yeah, you know, Linnaeus really did kind of have a weird definition for human too, because like <laughs> he 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 put. You know, members of our species that are almost, you know, were definitely humans. You know, all the people that he knew about at that time. But he also put, like, uh, weird monsters and, you know, satyrs and <laughs> and uh, all, all sorts of, like, monster people. Um, right. So, I don't know. That's, that, that is a, an interesting thing to think about. But uh, I guess just for the sake of ease, you know, I, I'm going to stick with homo equals human, mm. you know. Mm. And uh, if there are folks out there that do disagree with this, well, as you've seen, you're not really alone. <laughs> you know, hominines <laughs> can be humans, homo sapiens can be only humans. It, right. It's it's whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, it, it should be made clear that any physical or behavioral traits we want to use to distinguish homo from other hominins are not going to be static characters. You know, these features have evolved over a long period of time, and they show up very gradually piece by piece. You know, they were not all a part of this great package of traits that just suddenly made somebody a member of the genus Homo. You yeah, know, right. uh, paleoanthropologists have argued that, for example, the use of stone tools made somebody a member of the genus Homo. But then we learned that Australopithecines made them too. So that definition was out. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think basing technologies on a definition of genus isn't even really a good idea anyway, so it's... Yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't even think about that. Um, on more anatomical details, uh, paleoanthropologists argue that obligate bipedalism made somebody a member of Homo, you know, being free from tree living altogether. But what we find is that many species of early Homo were still adept tree climbers, and some mm. species of Australopithecines were competent bipeds on the ground. So even that's too fuzzy of a trait to use. 
Now, at present, there are a number of specific anatomical traits that work fairly well, things that we can use to say, okay, this is Homo and not Australopithecus, for example. Now, uh, the earliest known remains of Homo show a face that is distinctly flatter than that of Australopithecines, so prognathism is pretty much on its way out. Uh, yet the flattening of the face was not a total affair. Along the bottom of the forehead evolved a noticeable brow ridge. Now, this is curious because early hominins like Sahelanthropus chidensis had a big brow ridge too. But once the Australopithecine grade arrives on the scene, this feature is actually rare to non-existent. You know, that it shows up prominently again in the Homo lineage is interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's been hypothesized that big brow ridges evolve because the brain, and thus the skull, was getting larger. And mm -hmm. this is true in part. There is a spike in cranial capacity when we get to the genus Homo. More on that later. Uh, but virtual studies have ruled this hypothesis out. You know, the size of the brow does not match what would form following a growing brain. Um, so then we have another hypothesis that regards the architecture of our jaws. So a brow ridge formed because it was beneficial in reducing stress caused by our chewing muscles, given that the mm. sagittal crest was lost and our teeth were getting smaller, so we needed some extra support. But again, further studies have ruled this out. There really is no connection between the brow ridge and our jaws and chewing muscles. So where do we go from mm. here? Well, some researchers find it highly likely that the brow ridge played a key role in how we express ourselves visually. Primates are already visual animals with distinct facial expressions to signal when we're happy or when we're sad or when we're angry. Mm. With the gradual evolution of the hominin face away from the traditional ape-like features towards something similar to what we see in our species today, you know, having this sort of billboard on your forehead can really help with sending visual signals. In fact, there was one 2018 study by a Ricardo Godinho and colleagues who noted how some non-human primates have cranial features that correspond to social displays, and they suggest that early species of Homo developed a brow ridge in much the same way. Now, more work needs to be done on this, but so far this hypothesis has a lot going for it, I think. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah, I mean... Where our brow is now, we have these big bushy, you know, eyebrows, and you know, that's more than enough to kind of convey what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. Even you know, when we're thinking, it's like, oh, this person's thinking because right. they're scrunched up. <laughs> now, other anatomical features exist, which researchers use to define Homo. And while at the end of the day, you know, these taxonomic terms are often arbitrary. I mean, you know, we're, we're dealing with such intermediary fossils as these. You know, you're essentially arguing over the particulars of a gradient series. You know, if we do want to understand our lineage in a phylogenetic context and answer certain questions, uh, I think it would be really good to have a proper formalized scientific definition uh, or a crown group definition like Albert mentioned. Um, but we're, we're just not there yet. So we kind of have to stick to what we know and try to work with it as best we can. Now, uh, for the purposes of this episode... Uh, it's probably good to think of this part of our family tree as another evolutionary grade, like that of the Australopithecines. Um, the name Habilines is good to use, or Habilines, you know, after the species Homo habilis, as the hominins here bear a general resemblance to each other in anatomy and general behaviors, as we'll see as we continue forward. Now, the fossil jaw on the left here, this is specimen LD351, is the current contender for the oldest known specimen of Homo. Uh, Brian Villamore and colleagues described this specimen from Ethiopia in 2015, and it dates back 2.8 to 2.75 million years ago, which is significantly older than previously known material, and much of that is of better quality too. So they argue that LD351 belongs to the genus Homo because the features of the jaw and teeth more closely match what is currently known among species of Homo than to Australopithecines. Uh, the lack of cranial bones and postcrania means that this specimen is currently unclassified into any specific species. You know, we can't say whether this is Homo habilis or something new. Uh, but the authors are at least confident of a Homo classification. Uh, however, as is expected, there are some features that do match the earlier Australopithecine grade. You know, 
And since members of this particular phylogenetic group persisted for almost two million years more uh, from this time, you know, it's not inc inconceivable that this is the job in Australopithecine. Hmm. But, you know, who knows? We have to find more material. Uh, and, and thus the question is open and up in the air. So let's jump to the next slide here and uh, let's, you know, as usual, let's meet the folks. Um, this is the first haveline mm -hmm. to be described by anthropologists. Following a string of discoveries in Tanzania, Lewis and Mary Leakey and colleagues felt confident that the remains belonged to a new species, which they called Homo habilis. Or Homo habilis. Uh, the name means handy human because these finds were associated with stone tools, the earliest of their type at mm. the time. Uh, remains from this particular species date back 2.35 to 1.65 million years ago. The anatomy of Homo habilis is what you generally expect for a member of early Homo. Not too far removed from the Australopithecine grade, th there was a slightly prognathic jaw, but very much reduced from what was before. Uh, there were long arms with grasping hands, characteristic of a hominid that could climb trees fairly well, uh, as two examples of this. And features like these have led paleoanthropologists in the past to actually consider including this species into the genus Australopithecus. So sometimes you'll see in the literature uh, Australopithecus habilis as the name for this particular fossil. But, you know, the vast range of dry features, not to mention the phylogenetic analysis, suggests otherwise, that, you know, we should probably stick to calling this homo, uh, if we want to be correct. Now, besides the much larger brain than previous species, and the loss of the sagittal crest, the teeth and the jaws of Homo habilis are unlike those of Australopithecines. All the teeth, from the molars to the incisors, have shrunk in size. They're still larger than what is seen in modern humans today, but the size difference is very notable and the jaw shows the rounded arc arrangement of a modern human. In general, the structure of the mandible is far narrower than what is seen in the Australopithecine. Uh, in what little we have of the feet, including the OH8 specimen, which you can see at the top left here, uh, we can see that bipedal locomotion has only increased in efficiency for Homo habilis. The build of the arch in the foot is much more like a modern human, and the toes seem to be a lot less mobile than before. Uh, so the evidence is quite strong that, you know, while the species was still a competent tree climber, you know, it was probably spending more and more time on the ground upright. Mm. So the, uh, the signs of our genus are growing more and more as we move across the family tree. So jumping to the next slide here, as a, a quick aside, we have another instance of a taxonomy debate. Yay! <laughs> so, in 2010, so about a decade ago, uh, the anthropologist Darren Curnow made a case that a number of fossils from South Africa that had been in the past variously categorized as other known species of Homo, like Homo habilis, showed a distinct range of morphology that they justified being classified in a new species which he called Homo gautengensis, after the province of Gauteng, where most of these bones were found. In particular, Curnow noticed that the teeth of gautengensis were much larger in size than that of the contemporaneous species like Habilis, suggesting that the diet was more set on grasses and tougher plant foods than what other Homo species would be eating. Now, the morphology of the fossils concerned are interesting, and uh, you know, they, they might be telling us something important, but nearly every other researcher who's examined these particular remains has argued that the distinctions are just not enough to warrant an entirely new name for them. Hmm. You know, it's still up in the air, actually, you know, what we're looking at here. You know, is this regional variation among a known species of hominin? You know, is this sexual dimorphism? Is this a physical change in a single species over a period of time? You know, what, what we just saw with the Paranthropus remains from earlier in the series. You know, it's not, it's not even clear whether all of these fossils proposed for Gautengensis even belong to the same species. Oh, right. You know, we might be looking at multiple different species here. So, for the time being, it would be better to have more research and better remains 
before we just go around and start using the name Hobo Gautengensis. So uh, you're not going to hear that name coming from me with any confidence. Hmm. But, uh, you know, there are other people who tend to agree with this. But they're a very, very small minority. So let's move forward here. Uh, next up, we have Homo rudolfensis from Kenya. This is another species for which discourse has reigned supreme in regards to its identification. So the particular skull on the right here, uh, this is specimen KNMER1470, was unearthed in 1972 in rocks dated between 2 and 1.95 million years old. The skull is particularly strange in that the face was remarkably flat. Even the brow ridge was reduced in thickness. Uh, it's barely visible here. Mm. You can kind of tell, but like just barely. Um, in comparison with contemporaneous species like Homo habilis, the size of the skull was much larger as well. It nearly dwarfs the skull of habilis, actually. Mm. You know, this is unlike anything found before. And the team behind the discovery, which was Richard Leakey and colleagues, was sure that it belonged to the genus Homo, but they did not want to assign it to a known species before more research was done. And, you know, fast forward to 1986, when more research was done, and you have the anthropologist Valery Alexeyev, who studied the remains and found that he, was co he found the confidence to assign them to a new species, hence Homo rudolfensis. But again, the, uh, the situation was far from settled. And even today, there is still a sizable number of anthropologists who would contend that we're just looking at a member of Homo habilis that is quite distinct in features, but nonetheless belongs to the same species. Um, one researcher, David Cameron, even suggested a link with an early species, Kenyanthropus platyops, who you might remember, the, the mm. flat-faced man from Kenya. You know, when, so like, it would thus be that we're looking at Kenyanthropus rudolfensis, instead mm. of Homo rudolfensis. Um, in the end, though, when the phylogenetic studies were done, uh, and they included all of these named species, as well as others, the results showed that Homo rudolfensis could justifiably keep its identity as a unique species. Uh, it was different enough from Habilis and Kenyanthropus. Um, in fact, on the tree itself, it actually groups closer to the later members of Homo than Habilis does. So it seems that, indeed, Rudolfensis is distinct, for now. But, you know, new and better fossils can always change things. And it's not like the phylogenetic studies, anyway, are using a whole lot of characters from the entirety of the body, uh, which is notable. Mm -hmm. So let's jump to the next slide here. Ah, okay. The famous skull in the rock. Uh, th this is a fun story, actually. Mm -hmm. So, once upon a time... And by that I mean the fall of 2018. No, let me scratch that. The fall of 2008. I'm getting ahead of myself there. Uh, a young Matthew Berger, who was the son of the anthro paleoanthropologist Lee Berger, was out looking for fossils with his dog you know, while the family was out on a field expedition in Malapa, South Africa. At one point, Matthew trips on a log and he fell to the ground. And when he finally got up, he noticed a little gleam in a nearby rock and so he calls his dad over. Now, at that point, Lee Berger had been digging for a while, and he was finding all sorts of antelope fossils. And he was looking for hominins, but it was like for every one hominin fossil, there was something like thousands upon thousands of antelope bones. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can imagine, the luck was very thin. So to him, you know, this probably wasn't anything too exciting, you know, just another antelope. But when he took a closer look, he just lost his shit. <laughs> Nine-year-old Matthew had stumbled across the collarbone, or clavicle of a hominin. In fact, at the time, Lee Berger had just done his, you know, a major study on the clavicle of hominins. So he knew exactly what he was looking at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this was hominin. You know, not only that, he they flipped the rock over, and there was a whole mandible with teeth. <laughs> so now wow. things were getting really exciting. <laughs> So fast, uh, fast forward, and you know they returned to the site with a boatload of researchers, and, and they brought the whole cavalry, every kind of geologic and biological scientist you could think of. They brought them along because they knew they had something big here, and uh, they managed to find many more fossils of multiple individuals, uh, and uh, one particular that had a really beautifully preserved skull, as you can see here on the right, 
Um, you know, this was the one that Matthew Berger ended up finding that was inside the rock. Uh, it was specimen MH1, and so they nicknamed it Carabo, which means answer in the Swana language, hmm. which is a, a regional dialect. Now, because the remains are so complete, and the diagnostic features distinct enough, Lee Berger and colleagues coined them as a new species in 2010, when these were properly described, and they called them Australopithecus sediba. They felt that the fossils were intermediary enough between earlier Australopithecines and the genus Homo that this form might even be the direct ancestor of the Homo lineage. Now, wait a minute, you might be asking. You, you just covered Australopithecines in the last episode. Did you forget to mention this one? <laughs> Good guess, but actually no. <laughs> so, y yes, yes. The initial analysis of the remains did place these in the genus Australopithecus as an australopithecine grade hominid. And it was generally small-bodied like the others. It had a small cranial capacity and noticeable prognathism. You know, the fingers were noticeably curved and the arms were lengthy. You know, these are the sort of things we see in australopithecines. But there is a sheer volume of anatomical features that point to a relation with the genus Homo. Mm. Small teeth on a narrow jaw, a rounded skull lacking a sagittal crest, slight brow ridge, wide human-like pelvis that supported legs, which could walk with some efficiency, among other things. You know, for an Australopithecine, Sediba seems to greatly resemble a member of early Homo, perhaps something mm -hmm. like Homo habilis. Right. You know, even in the abstract of that paper, Berker et al. even states, and I quote, combined craniodental and postcranial evidence demonstrates that this new species shares more derived features with early Homo than any other Australopith species, and thus might help reveal the ancestor of that genus. Hmm, that's uh, <laughs> that's interesting. But you know, as is typical for many paleoanthropologists, they did not perform a phylogenetic analysis mm -hmm. to get an idea of identity. But others have done so, and what do they reveal? Well, if we go to the next slide. Uh-huh. Australopithecus sediba not only nestles within the Homo lineage, mm. it actually gets placed as a sister species to Homo habilis. Ah. And that would mean that the name needs to be changed accordingly into Homo sediba. Now, at present, despite these results, I have yet to see any studies that include these remains and refer to it by this particular name of Homo mm. sediba. You know, if I've missed any, please let me know. But, you know, if we want to use an honest phylogenetic approach to studying hominins, you know, we've got to eliminate these paraphyletic terms. So, you know, it only makes sense to use Homo sediba instead of Australopithecus sediba, since this species does not group with Australopithecus africanus. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I suppose it bears mentioning that all this discussion about sediba having to do with the ancestry of Homo and whether it belongs in Australopithecus or not, you know, it just goes to show how fantastic the hominin fossil record has become. Yeah. You know, we started with not a lot, and then we had a handful of species, you know, enough to get a, a fair idea of ancestor-descendant relationships, and now we have so many fossils and species that it's increasingly difficult to tell who is who. You know, all the forms blend into each other in such a way that you know, drawing lines in the sand is next to impossible. Mm -hmm. Now, if paleoanthropologists everywhere just try to adopt the phylogenetic approach, maybe we can get a we can clear up some of these matters, and and you know, okay. we, we can get away from this sort of essentialist thinking. You know, it's either this genus or it's this genus. <laughs> right. But uh, you know, I digress. <laughs> um, before we move on, though, you know, if you haven't been looking already, you know, I've shared this really lovely reconstruction by the Kennis brothers of Homo sediba. Hmm. You know, they have really made a name for themselves in reconstructing fossil hominins. You know, Google them and see for yourselves. Or, you know, you can check out books with their artwork. Um, you know, one that I really like is the uh, the Dorling Kendersley uh, Evolution, the Human Story. Hmm. You know, they, yeah. they have a, a second edition out now uh, from 2018, so it's fairly still up to date and it's actually been a really great resource for this series. Um, and, you know, they have a whole lot of great facial reconstructions from, you know, Sahelanthropus all the way to Homo sapiens. So go ahead and give them a look if you haven't already. So let's move on here. 
Now, uh, up to this point in the Hamadan story, you know, we've been confined to the continent of Africa, as most of our evolution took place there until fairly recently. At the start of the Pleistocene epoch, so 2.58 million years ago, the Earth was continuing its cooling and it had entered its most recent ice age, what is known technically as the Quaternary Glaciation, after the geologic period that we currently have it, the Quaternary. You know, this was this was a time of continuous change, you know, when enormous glaciers spread outwards from the poles, covering vast swaths of the world's land masses, mm -hmm. and times when the climate warmed and things got temporarily comfortable. So kind of a back and forth between cool and warm. So, you know, why was this particular ice age so extreme in this way? Well, it seems that there was a combination of factors at play. With the gradual moving of tectonic plates, the collision of continents continued. Newly formed mountain ranges like the Himalayas and the Alps, you know, they were rising higher and higher as Africa was pushing into Europe and India was pushing into Asia. And uh, these were blocking off more air currents. In the seas, the currents changed too, as the land masses you know, would separate or get smushed together, you know, causing the currents to shift course. Now, changing the settings on the air and ocean thermostat can you know, do a lot to change the global climate, as I'm mm -hmm. sure you're all aware. And the situation was only exacerbated by the ongoing Milankovitch cycles, where the Earth undergoes shifts in its orbit and its axial tilt. Uh, now, at first, the Ice Age started out rather sporadically. You know, these glacial cycles were appearing every 41,000 years or so. But then, around the middle of the Pleistocene, so about 1.25 million years ago, the cycles extended to 100,000 year intervals. Now, we don't know exactly what happened to cause this dramatic shift, um, but there have been links to the erosion of rocks by the newly forming glaciers. You know, that, that has been a proposal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is a process that sucks up CO2 from the atmosphere, which noticeably began to drop at the 1.25 million year mark. So maybe there's a connection there. But in any case, the glaciations were not as extreme during the early part of the Pleistocene, and so the conditions were fair enough in Africa and Eurasia to maintain a network of grasslands and open woodlands across the continents when the climate was favorable. Now, sometimes you'll see this in the literature referred to by the kind of humorous nickname Savannistan, as, it, <laughs> as you know, it was extending into the Middle East as well. Now, in Africa, hominins were still doing fairly well. You know, Australopithecines still ranged across eastern and southern Africa, as you can see in the red here. Um, you know, we have members of Paranthropus lineage, as well as the last surviving Australopithecus africanus, for example. Now, the evolution of Homo by 2.8 million years ago brought on yet another clade of hominins, and one that still seemed comfortable climbing trees and using resources in the open woodlands, as well as the savannas. By 1.8 million years ago, they had spread across Africa, but there is evidence that they had reached out into Eurasia far earlier than this. Now, at present, the earliest definitive evidence of the genus Homo in Eurasia are the 1.85 million year old fossils from Dominici in Georgia, whom we'll meet in a moment. But in recent years, a number of stone tools, which are characteristic of the type made by members of Homo, have been unearthed in places like the Zorka Valley of Jordan, dated 2.5 million years ago, and as far as present-day Shangshan, China, going back 2.1 million years ago. That's, that's very curious. But these sites do fall well into the area enclosed by this mid-latitude belt of open woodland and grassland that hominins mm -hmm. were known to inhabit, as I've highlighted in the bright green here. Now, the conditions were okay enough for hominins to move between Africa and Eurasia, and back again. For all we know, lineages of Australopithecines might have even extended their range you know, this way too. The evidence is growing that, you know, but you know, we're, we're not quite there yet to say with 100% certainty. You know, the yeah. presence of stone tools of a sort similar to those made by Homo habilis and kin is very telling. You know, and if phylogenetic studies hold out, that some more recently living hominins, like Homo floresiensis, again, who we'll meet soon, belong to the Habilene grade, then that is also strong evidence for such an early expansion out of Africa. Now, uh, <laughs> it must also be made clear that this 
traditional idea of out of Africa has been riddled with holes for some time. So conventionally, there have been two out of Africa movements proposed for the hominin lineage. You know, you got one for Homo erectus and one for us. You know, as if there were only two specific migrations out of the continent and none else. But, you know, if the climate and environment at the time was suitable for hominins, you know, with this mid-latitude belt spread across South Africa all the way to China, and as well as Europe, well, then there really is nothing stopping hominins from expanding their ranges beyond their evolutionary homeland. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if resources are plentiful, and it seems that they were, and if there's enough land, and it seems that there was, well, then of course we find traces of Habilines in Eurasia, you know, so soon after their evolution. You know, indeed, this is a this is a complicated story, you know, that has only just been getting interesting within the last few years. So, you know, just let's just wait a couple more years to see where the evidence leads, right? <laughs> yeah. So let's go ahead and continue on to the next slide here. You know, let's turn back to our family tree. So this is Homo georgicus, with that you know, that first definitive evidence of a hominin presence outside Africa. Now, granted, Georgia is not dramatically far from northeastern Africa, but this is still exciting nonetheless. Uh, these are dated between 1.85 and 1.77 million years ago, uh, and these hominins of Dominici have revealed some very beautifully preserved remains, as well as a boatload of controversy. Now, some researchers convinced of the old idea of out of Africa 1 prefer to see these guys as early Homo erectus, mm -hmm. perhaps a subspecies, which would be Homo erectus georgicus, you know, that had just started its migration away from Africa. But other researchers who note this remarkable diversity in form among all of these five skulls here, you know, they are seeing evidence of actually multiple species from this lo location. Now, uh, I admit I'm skeptical of the first claim on uh, one important front. You know, with the little phylogenetic work that we have done, we can see that these remains are distinct from Homo erectus. Mm -hmm. They emerge from a much earlier diverging branch than them. You know, which means regarding the hypothesis that there was more than one species at Dominici, you know, in, in that instance, mm, it's not too outlandish. You know, I, 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 we have yet to see good evidence that this was the case. Right. You know, these fossils do span a significant period of time. You know, from the oldest remains to the youngest remains, we're talking about a period of 100,000 years. So maybe some of these skulls have been redeposited. Or, you know, maybe we're looking at gradual evolution within a single species. Again, the robustest situation. Uh, now, the case for Homo georgicus being distinct. So all of these skulls belong to one species, Homo georgicus, you know, that lies in their general anatomy, other than the phylogenetic work that places them among the Havilines. Mm -hmm. you know, for one, the size and proportions of the body and the limbs are similar to what we see in early Homo, and more so than in later Homo, like Erectus. You know, in terms of cranial capacity, Homo georgicus does match early Homo. You know, it falls into that category as well. Um, with, with some similarities to later species, too. You know, th this matches what the phylogeny shows, that Homo georgicus and its lineage branched off after species like Homo habilis, but before those like Homo erectus. So, uh, yeah, a bit of, bit of controversy around these folks. But you know, regardless of the classification issues, there is at least one really exciting aspect of the study of Homo georgicus that reveals some Neat info on behavior. Generally, in primate populations, if an individual is injured in some way, there is not a real drive by the others to care for it. Mm. Now, grooming, of course, has medical benefits. You know, individuals are removing parasites and other things from each other. But, but you know, when it comes to something like a broken leg or maybe the loss of sight in one eye, you know, primates generally don't act like nurses and doctors. You know, an injured or sick primate often becomes a burden to the group and mm -hmm. is thus left behind to fend for itself, which means that death comes sooner for that individual, right. depending on the situation. 
Now, for humans like us, Homo sapiens, you know, care for the sick and infirm is much more prevalent than in any other living primate. Mm-hmm. It's not a universal by any means. You know, there are societies that have left the elderly and the injured to die, but you know, most of us see it as a necessity to care for the sick in a very intimate way. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's that's very widespread. So, you know, then the question arises, when did this form of compassion show up in the hominin clade if it's not really present among all the other primates? Well, with Homo georgicus, we at least have a benchmark. So of the five skulls uncovered at Dominici, one has lost nearly all of their teeth. And that's Mm -hmm. the skull that I've actually singled out here way at the left. Uh, The analysis shows that this is an elderly individual as evidenced by the fact that the tooth sockets have actually been reabsorbed. Wow, yeah. So, you know, if, if this was any other primate, you know, they probably would have starved a long time ago, even before this reabsorption, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, because you know, they, they couldn't chew anything properly. And, you know, here they are, well past that point. They seem to have outlived that injury, you know, losing all their teeth. You know, this seems like very clear evidence that hominins, at least like you know, Homo Georgicus, or like it, were actually caring for the sick and injured. You mm-hmm. know, uh, they would have been processing and providing food for this old person. You know, I, I can picture them at least maybe uh, chewing up the food before passing it over to the individual orally. You know, yeah, we're, we're, a, right. we're a long time before spoons and forks, after all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, know, you know, what this is called premastication, that actually is common in primates. Including all of the great apes, you know that, that's t- that's typically how they feed their babies um, when they're starting them out on uh, more solid foods, and you know a number of human societies do engage in this particular behavior. So you know that's not an unlikely scenario. I feel, you know, mm-hmm. you know some researchers even go as far as to say that this is the small beginning of what would eventually become romantic kissing today. Mm-hmm. But you know that, that's contentious territory. I, right, I don't really right. have time to cover that here. But you know, nonetheless. Compassion in hominins seems to have arrived by 1.77 million years ago. You know, part of our growing primate heritage of social living. And things are only going to get more and more interesting from there. So let's jump to the next slide. Uh, Next up, we have the original hobbits. Mm. Well, you know, at least that's what the the popular press will tell you. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, as far as we know, Homo floresiensis was nothing like Tolkien's hobbits. You know, Mm. save for their height. You know, they only reached as tall as 1.1 meters. So that's about 3.7 feet. (laughs) Which, incidentally, is far shorter than any human group alive today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and most of the other hominins that we know about, save for maybe some of the female Australopithecines. Yeah. Uh, So incidentally, you know, I I have yet to see any fan art of these folks, you know, decked out like hobbits, you know, living in hobbit holes. (laughs) (laughs) If anybody knows of any, please let me know. I'd love to see it. (laughs) Or maybe I, maybe I have to take over that 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 duty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, here we admittedly jump far forward in time. You know, this was a hominin that lived at least one hundred and ninety thousand to fifty thousand years ago on the island of Flores in Indonesia. You know, that means that this species was contemporaneous with Homo sapiens. Mm-hmm. Although the question arises whether they actually met each other or not. You know, we do appear to have been in that part of the world at least by 55,000 years ago, so the possibility is there. Again, we're, we're on a lack of evidence here. Um, on a related note, there is evidence of even earlier human activity on Flores. Uh, mm-hmm. There are some skeletal remains and stone tools that date back 700,000 years ago, which were described in 2016 by Adam Broom and colleagues. And... Uh, they most likely have something to do with Homo floresiensis. They might even belong to the same species as an ancestral population, if you will. And the bones and the tools do match what we have for floresiensis. Um, except the biggest and most surprising difference is they're actually even tinier than the more recent remains. <laughs> wow. So you know, we have a long way to go before we can assign a proper identification to this small handful of 700,000-year-old fossils. But uh, as far as what we know as Homo Freestensis is concerned, we can be a lot more confident about its status, though it certainly took a long time to get there. So when the first fossils of these folks were unearthed in 2003, including the specimen LB1, or Flo, who I've shown here, the skeleton and the close-up of the skull and the feet, 
uh, there was a big flurry of excitement. You know, wow, this is this is different than anything we've seen. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the description of these remains, the following year, 20, 2004, you know, especially owing to their size, they were conclu- the researchers concluded that these remains were very distinct. And so they coined a name, Homo floresiensis, for them. You know, this is the new species of hominin. And this immediately caused a huge amount of debate regarding the remains. You know, the, for example, there was a whole pool of researchers who had argued that the flora's remains were not so much a distinct species, but members of our own, Homo sapiens. Because, you know, for the time, all we had that was really complete was the LB1 specimen. And they thought that this was an individual who had microcephaly. Uh, which is a condition that causes an infant's skull to form far, uh, a lot smaller than what is expected for the person mm-hmm. as a whole. You know, and this can lead to all sorts of medical issues. Uh, other researchers, much later on, posited all sorts of explanations for these remains, you know, ranging from Lauren syndrome to Down syndrome to explain the, uh, the size discrepancy with other humans. And, uh, well, as more remains of the site were unearthed, they all showed the exact same features with the LB1 specimen. You know, it, it seems highly unlikely that an entire group of humans with microcephaly or Down syndrome just so happened to find each other and hide away on a singular island in Southeast Asia. So I, I, think, the more, I think the more parsimonious explanation is that these are indeed a distinct species. Um, mm-hmm. But then, of course, the discourse didn't even stop with that. You know, now there's a matter of placing Homo floresiensis in the context of other hominins. You know, for the for the very longest time, the biggest contender is that these this species is a case of insular dwarfism for a lineage that descended from the more familiar Homo erectus. And so, uh, Homo erectus arrives on Flores. It's an island. So, as a, as a general rule with species, in order to save resources and, and living space, they, they shrink over time. And we see this all over the place. You know, we would have a Homo erectus, which is generally about as tall as a modern human, eventually evolving into what we see here, a little 3.7 foot Homo floresiensis. And the timing of the geologic remains fit well with this. You know, and, and as well as some of the skeletal features too. You know, the shoulder joint and the clavicle were argued to be very similar to what we see in Homo erectus. But many more parts of the skeleton were telling a different story: the length of the arms versus the legs, the the bones of the wrist, especially the shape of the cranium, among other traits. They were all pointing in the direction of a far earlier species of Homo, and to an extent, Australopithecines. So, well, <laughs> what do the phylogenetic studies have to say? In almost every case, Homo floresiensis groups with the Habiline grade hominins and very early in the lineage, too. And so, several researchers now consider that this species, in the context of the, uh, the case of the earlier and earlier population expansions out of Africa across the Savannah Stand mm-hmm. corridor. Now, save for some of those tantalizing stone tools from the Chinese and Jordan sites over two million years ago or so, as well as the Dominici fossils, we really don't have any other evidence regarding possible ancestral forms in the greater parts of Eurasia that could have given rise to Homo floresiensis. You know, should we ever find anything good, the response is going to be massive, I'm sure. Right. Um, Now, as with this species, we can be confident of another key milestone in the human story, and that is the adaptation of a hominin in tropical rainforest conditions. Mm, right. So with the long, strong arms and the short body, as well as particularly long feet for a hominin, Homo floresiensis would have been very good at climbing trees, as early Homo seems to have been. And so it was the, the change in the type of forest that was especially special. You know, because until this lineage, all the hominins had been staying in open woodlands, and at most on the open savanna, but never in a rainforest setting um, that we know of, at least. So if we jump to the next slide here, uh, when the ancestors of Homo floresiensis reached Flores, the general ecology matched something that you'd see on other Indonesian islands today, that is, tropical deciduous forest. You know, with a, a rainy wet season and a, a mild dry season. And 
Likewise, the animal life would have, been, would have generally resembled what lives in the region today. You know, various kinds of lizards and birds and mammals. Now, from the cultural remains we have for Homo floresiensis, including stone tools, we have evidence that a source of food was the young of an elephant-like species called Stegodon florensis. Now, that genus itself, Stegodon, was a fairly successful animal. Uh, remains have been found across Africa and Eurasia, and thus came in a wide range of shapes and sizes. Um, I, I think the, the biggest Stegodon reached something like almost four meters tall, you know, which would have made them some of the largest yeah. mammals that ever lived on land, uh, uh, along with other contenders, of course. There were, there were mammoths that got about as big, as well as the, uh, the exciting Andricotheres, who are uh, members of the rhino mm-hmm. lineage. Um, but the species on Flores was a shrimp. You know, uh, due, due right. to the uh, insular dwarfism phenomenon that we talked about earlier, uh, Florensis only grew a little bit taller than Homo floresiensis itself. <laughs> it was about as small as a, mm-hmm. I don't know, a yak maybe. Um, which yeah, is yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's small for a proboscidean. Um, right. But there were giants on the island as well, uh, giant rats in particular, <laughs> Papagomies. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, at the largest size, they could have been about 45 centimeters long, uh, plus an additional 70 centimeters for the tail. <laughs> right. So, you know, that, that would have been a really good source of food for Hummel Floresiensis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, now, they probably weren't as threatening to Hummel Floresiensis as some of the other members of the community. Right. You know, there, there were some serious dangers on the island. Um, the one species that can still be found on Flores today is the Komodo dragon which is mm-hmm. currently the largest living lizard on the earth, not including snakes, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's powerful, it's venomous, it's capable of working in groups to bring down large prey animals, and it weighs about 70 kilograms at the largest. You know, this this would have been an animal that was probably feared by Homo floresiensis. You're right. No doubt about that. This was a an island-living smog for the little Bilbo. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> and uh, let, let's not forget the, the strangest sight on the island. Uh, that I think, at least, uh, the giant marabou stork, yeah. um, Leptopilos robustus. Now, for us, maybe it's not that strange. You know, us paleo folks, you know, right. we're, we're very familiar with giant birds living on islands. <laughs> I mean, Albert, yeah. you've already covered a fair number of them already. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the living marabou stork is an impressive animal in, 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 by itself. Um, yeah. It's a 1.5 meter tall carrion eater with a long bill and a very wrinkly face. Um, for those not in the know, you've probably seen these in the opening of The Lion King, the birds that fly oh, yeah. out across the waterfowl. Yeah. Um, no, I, I still remember that kid. Oh, this is a little aside. Um, when I went to visit the Smithsonian, this was years ago, before the, the new Fossil Hall's opening. Um, I always loved hanging out in the, uh, the Bones exhibit, where you just had this beautiful okay. collection That's of great. yeah vertebrate remains from fish to mammals. And... Uh, there was this kid, so I, I'm in the bird area, and they have you know all the the wading birds together. There's a very beautiful marabou stork skeleton there, and this kid just bursts into the hall. And he's jumping up and down. It's a marabou stork! It's a marabou stork! <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this, this this is his favorite animal, and this is Christmas morning for him. <laughs> oh, that that's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a cool bird. I, 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 if if I, I didn't love Kildare so much, I'd probably include it in my favorites list. Right, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, the marabou storks on Flores, however, these grew to about 1.8 meters tall. Right. Now, put that in the context of a 1.1 meter tall Homo floresiensis. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as to say that these birds actually attacked these hominins. You know, I'm, mm. I'm not. I'm, I wouldn't argue that these were predators of Floresiensis. You know, but there's no reason to think that they couldn't have been a serious danger. You know, right. uh, I, I, I can see a, a group of Floresiensis, you know, butchering a, a stegodon kill as they usually do, and of course, all that meat lying around would attract mm. the scavengers, including these giant birds yep. <laughs> that are like, "Hey, you got some good stuff <laughs> right. here. I'm gonna just uh, muscle my way in." <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, oh, that that would have been an impressive sight. So, yeah, there you go. That, that's a that's a little taste of the world of Flores in this wonderful Hobbit community. I might love to see more remains of these in the near future. But we have to move Definitely, on. Yeah. <laughs> so let's jump to the next slide here. 
Uh, this is the last hominid I want to talk about today. Um, it's also the newest one that we know about. This is Homo luzonensis. So this is from Luzon Island in the Philippines. Uh, it was only described in 2019, so just last year. Yep, um, brand new. Yeah, I oh, I wish I could go as in-depth about this as Georgicus or Felicensis, <laughs> but the simple fact is we don't have enough remains. You know, mm-hmm. what you're seeing here is almost everything. We have a few premolars, some molars, uh, we got a couple finger and toe bones, and uh, part of the femur who belonged to a juvenile, and all these date to 67,000 years old. And that's it. That is all that this species has to its name. Um, now, you might be thinking, well, that's not enough to coin a new species, is it? Well, I mean, <laughs> for one, they're in the Philippines, and they're very, very small in size. You know, smaller than any human populations that live in the Philippines, or that we know about that lived in the Philippines. You know, they actually, this is drawn comparisons to Homo floresiensis. Um, so, we're confident about the distinction there, but the remains are still far too few to place this in a phylogenetic context. You know, actual fossil evidence of, a, of the earliest human presence in the Philippines is hard to come by. And mm-hmm. the most that we actually have that could tell us something about Lucinensis are some signs of human activity that were on the same island as these fossils were found. And they date back about 777,000 to 631,000 years ago. So, you know, they might have something to do with Luzonensis. Again, this might be a Luzonensis situation where we have the ancestral population that gave rise to Luzonensis. Um, but again, we only have activity, signs of activity. We don't have fossils from, the, from that time. So we just kind of have to wait and see whether these stand out. So, of course, we have to move on from here on the next slide. Uh, we can finally put a little bit of visualization to this tangled mess that is early homo phylogeny. Now, I, of course, I've gone over some of this here and there, but uh, I'll give a quick recap and summary of what we know. So, first things first. That 2.8 million year old jaw, the specimen LD351, is, again, unclassifiable, as far as species is concerned. We know it belongs to the genus Homo. That's as far as we can place it. Uh, two, there is further uncertainty regarding the base of the Homo family tree. Now, some of the phylogenetic analyses that I had alluded to earlier find that a branch containing Homo habilis and Homo sediba, which if you remember was previously classified as Charlopithecus, emerged first. Others find the first branch containing Homo floresiensis and its kin. Um, again, we can't be sure where Homo luzonensis goes, um, if it relates to Fluisiensis, then it may very likely belong to that lineage as a sister species. That remains to be seen. Um, those 700,000-year-old bones on Flores and the 777, 631,000-year-old signs of activity on Luzon are similarly tricky to place. Um, so again, we don't know with 100% certainty that they have anything to do with Fluisiensis or Luzonensis, respectively. But if they do, well, then they effectively extend the range of time for those species by many hundreds of thousands of years. And so on this tree, I put them uh, as sort of different colored circles appearing below the Luzonensis and Fluisiensis lines with little question marks, just in case they have anything to do with it. Now, the third point. Uh, the next two clades, we can be fairly certain of. Several, several studies have recovered the same results. Uh, Homo brutalfensis branches off next, followed by Homo georgicus. Now, of course, the latter still causes controversy, as I've stated previously. Uh, several researchers still contend that it is intimately related to Homo erectus, uh, whether to, as a sister species or even as a subspecies. Um, and so, they, and they argue that certain anatomical features justify that decision. But for now, I'm going to keep it separate here. Now, before we cover the larger trends in the story of early Homo, I should probably explain a little bit about these blue labels that say Eurasia. Now this ties to our previous discussion of the Eurasian expansions in the hominid range. Uh, you remember that there was this large band of open woodland and grassland that stretched across Africa and Eurasia that would have provided comfortable territory for early hominins. Species could have freely moved between the continents without much fanfare. Um, here we have some very interesting possibilities 
regarding early Homo in Eurasia. So, the lineage leading to Homo floresiensis, and by possible extension, Homo luzonensis, extended out of Africa over a period of time and eventually settled in Southeast Asia. As the family tree grew, other species would have made similar trips, and one happened to include the ancestors of Homo georgicus entering the Caucasus region before 1.85 million years ago. Hmm. Now, here's where things get really contentious. We know that this Savannistan was a continuous region, and that travel through it must have been relatively easy for early hominins, since they didn't have to appear to continuously walk or run for long distances. You know, we're, we're not there yet. They could have just comfortably stayed within the trees, gradually, gradually, gradually expanding their range. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, with so much traffic coming to and fro between Africa and Eurasia, the possibility rises that a mainstream in the Homo lineage actually spread into Eurasia for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And from this mainstream would have emerged Homo georgicus, already living in Eurasia, as well as later species that we'll meet who could have actually expanded into Africa from Eurasia. Mm -hmm. Meaning that we could have a, an out-of-Eurasia situation more than an out-of-Africa situation. Right. Now, it's neat to think about, since it basically upends decades of convention, uh, which is always fun. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, admittedly, I, I do have to kind of hit a pause button here and, and make this point. You know, as I've aged and I, I read more and more paleoanthropology, uh, I, I come to wonder if the discourse around out of Africa versus out of Eurasia is kind of moot. Mm -hmm. So uh, I actually recently finished rereading the anthropologist Clive and Layson's book, uh, The Humans Who Went Extinct, uh, in part for this series and in part for myself. You know, it, it's a decade old now, but uh, you know, a funny thing happened as I was reading through it. A lot of the discussion still holds up strongly today. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, has been vindicated by new research. In the first few chapters, Finlayson expresses his frustrations with these apparent continent divides. You know, that is, this way of thinking that Africa and Eurasia have been mm -hmm. real barriers to the evolution of humans. Right. So uh, I'm going to quote from his book The strict political division of continents, a distinction that has never existed other than in our minds, complicated our understanding of how early primates and apes got to where they did. The same simplistic distinction has been widely applied in the human origins debate. I think that this way of carving up the Afro-Eurasian landmass has held back progress in our understanding of what really happened, and how it happened, by more than two decades. And I guess, if you want, you can throw in an extra decade here. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Finlayson goes on, even using examples from historical ornithology, of all things, mm -hmm. uh, to make his case that human evolution could have very easily continued anywhere in Afro-Eurasia, and that Southwest Asia, aka the Middle East, was not a wholly inhospitable wall that prevented all but the bravest of hominins from scaling it. You know, rarely in large continental land masses as these do species make conscious migrations in population from one place to another. And, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about seasonal migration. I, I right, mean, right. a species extending a year-long range into new territory. So, uh, for example, in the book, he talks about the, uh, the azure-winged magpie, uh, which is a corvid. Um, today, this bird lives in East Asia and Iberia, but not between them. And so he looks at the historical record, as well as the geologic record for this particular species, as well as the genetics, and he shows that, indeed, this bird had a range across Eurasia at one point that subsequently got split hmm. due to you know, geologic conditions and, and environmental constraints and that sort of thing. Uh, basically, show, and because previously it was argued that, okay, well, these birds live in East Asia and Iberia, so maybe uh, the original population was in East Asia, and then they all moved to Iberia at some point in right. the past, or the other way around, and this was complicating things, and so Finlayson's like, no, 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 this bird, you know, the area this bird lived in was generally the same ecologically, and so this species had just a wide range, and it could have evolved anywhere in this in this region, and just happened to get separated mm. by, mm. you know, events of geology and history, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, in, in human evolution, 
and as we're going to see in later episodes, there's often talk of human migrations, and, oh, right. and, and you see these maps with arrows drawn on them showing the, the different routes and so forth. You know, these maps are only educational to a point, as right. they hide significant details as the ones that I explained. Mm-hmm. You know, w- when species expand their range, they usually don't send droves of individuals <laughs> in the same direction, follow right. the exact same path until they reach a so-called destination. <laughs> right. It, it, it's very gradual. And it all depends on the circumstances related to population density, the availability of food and other resources, and environmental mm-hmm. conditions. You know, a species mm-hmm. will only stop moving ahead if the region they were slowly expanding towards doesn't meet the requirements they need to survive and to live. Right. So in, in the case of early Homo that we talked about, you know, there's this enormous savanna stand belt reaching all the way around after Eurasia. And save for the peculiarities of the local flora and fauna, condition-wise, it was about the same. You know, you pick up a, a Homo habilis in southern Africa and, and plop him down in India or southern China, and he'd probably do okay. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it makes absolute sense that hominins seemingly expanded their range in the way that they did. You know, and without being conscious of, uh, you know, oh, I'm in Africa or I'm in your region. Right. You know, for them, this whole thing was home. You know, uh, Albert, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a that's a very uh, important point to keep in mind. Yeah, it's, it's definitely... Yeah, or organisms don't don't uh, work like that, where they're like you just described, where they just send representatives to go forth and go go in that direction until you can't anymore, or anything like that. It's you know, it's more more common for them to just uh, just move according to the conditions that they prefer. And so, if there's suitable habitat in one region, they will likely expand their range there just gradually over time um, just because they they can because it's suitable for them um, and that seems to be what, what is happening here yeah exactly um so yeah i would like us to keep this in mind as we move forward in this series you know because you know eventually i'm going to talk about the spread of homo sapiens around the mm-hmm. world you know that's a topic that is pretty high in fascination for me <laughs> regarding mm-hmm. this subject so uh, we'll be sure to cover it uh, in the right kind of way so let's, uh, let's move forward now. Now, uh, on the next slide here, uh, in keeping with our discussion on the anatomy and evolution of the human body, now would be a good time to unravel the mystery of our apparent hairlessness. You know, to, mm. to, to quote the title of the famous 1967 book by Desmond Morris, we are the naked ape, right? <laughs> well, technically, no. <laughs> you know, we actually have the same density of hair as the other apes. It's just that ours is noticeably thinner. You know, you, you can see this fairly clearly if you're able to, you know, get get a really close look at your own body. You know, we have hair on our arms and our legs and on our chests and bellies, our faces. And, you know, not just on our heads and armpits and genital regions. You know? Right. And the, still, like this particular arrangement is very distinct from any other primate that we have today, for the most part. So, you know, the question begs. When did, when did our hair become so thin as to mistake us as naked? Well, you know, right out of the gate, I have to say that we don't know for sure. Mm-hmm. Here we're entering hypothesis land again, you know, with, with all sorts of researchers offering their own ideas based on the evidence that they find or put mm-hmm. forward. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a really popular hypothesis regards our lives on the open savanna, you know, which put us in constant pressure of the sun's heat. Now, if you've ever worn a thick coat during the summer, you can see where this is going. Right. You know, just by taking a quick survey of, say, the animals of the East African savanna, you know, you find that practically none of the really large mammals have thick fur around their body. Well, save for the lion's mane, but that's a that's a special exception. You know, their fur is either very thin, so think about, you know, a zebra or an antelope, or they've lost it for the most part. So think about a rhino or an elephant. You know, we know from environmental data that hominins were associating themselves with open grasslands, especially in the later Australopithecines like Africanus. Now, it needs to be mentioned that you know, while we're not the only species that sweats, our system of sweat is quite unique hmm. in that we only perspire water. Whereas those other animals that do sweat, they kind of pour out a mix of substances. Um, on the human body, we have two kinds of sweat glands. So the apocrine glands, 
which are located in our hair and on the genitals as well as the armpits, and the eccrine glands, which are found everywhere else. Now, the apogreen sweat glands are in a class of their own. You know, they're most, they mostly function as a result of emotional stimuli. So, mm -hmm. like, if you're really stressed out or if you're having sex. But the, uh, the eccrine sweat glands are directly tied to cooling. When we perspire from out of our back or on our arms, you know, that's our body's way of ridding ourselves of excess heat. Mm -hmm. And so, here's the kicker. So, the hypothesis goes, as members of the human lineage continue to live further and further in open grassland environments, the continuous heat of the sun was a selection pressure on us. Those of us with less thick fur on our bodies were able to keep cooler and thus function more and more in the heat than those with the typical ape fur, you know, allowing for the uh, selection to, con to continuously grow our sweat glands across the body. And uh, over time, you know, that only increased until we reached the condition that we see today where the only significant patches of fur on our bodies is in our hair, you know, and that is, is really part of the only part of our body that's always facing the sun. So mm -hmm. it kind of helps to have that additional protection there because uh, as a rule in certain environments, fur can act as heat protection, right. but that's usually like in forest conditions, for example. Now that, that's a very convincing hypothesis, I think, but there are others as well that offer their own insights as well as corrections. So there was a 2016 study by uh, Thomas David Barrett and Robert Ian Dunbar who looked at human fur loss in the context of species range at different altitudes. Hmm. So they claim from environmental data that many of the early hominins were living in more diverse upland environments than hmm. just on the lower grasslands. And this is true. You know, recall our discussion of the origins of bipedality in an open woodland context, right? So the, uh, the bipedal australopithecines, in particular, you know, they would have still needed their fur because they may have been foraging at various times throughout the day and at various heights where things were a little bit cooler. You know, if you're, for example, if you're, if you're looking for food on a cool night on a high hilly area, well, you, you'd wanna have, you want to have, you still want to have your fur to keep you warm. Otherwise, now you have to struggle with the cold instead of the heat. Hmm. So in the end, the authors do consider the previous hypothesis uh, correct, but they update it as an adaptation of later Homo. Mm. So things like Homo erectus. And this, of course, corresponds with the climatic changes at the start of the Pleistocene 2.58 million years ago, when the cooling of the Earth's climate made the warmer lowlands a little bit more accessible to our species, uh, or at least more comfortable. Mm. And you, that's not to forget that when we reach early Homo, we find that bipedal locomotion had gotten more efficient and mm -hmm. modern human-like. You know, so this is fascinating research for sure. Um, but to be fair, the, the question is still open. You know, this has not been universally accepted by all anthropologists. Um, in fact, some of them have gone as far as to argue that fur loss was due to the need to reduce parasite loads. You're right. <laughs> Although this hypothesis is, is not very popular at all. Um, in fact... Funny thing, when we turn to the evolutionary history of lice in particular, as you can probably catch from the slide, mm -hmm. then we find some hints to the problem of furlessness. Mm. Now, uh, when the genetic data from common lice species was analyzed in humans as well as in other animals, related animals, uh, researchers were able to construct phylogenies and uncover the dates when the lineages diverged from each other. And this has told us something about the loss of fur in hominins. So here we're concerned with two types of human lice. Uh, the species Pediculus humanus, which is head lice, aka nits or cooties, um, and uh, Pythiris pubis, which is pubic lice, or crabs, or uh, willipedes, or uh, galloping dandruff, or uh, bloomer crickets, or uh, weenie sprinkles, or... <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop now. <laughs> but um, by looking at the phylogeny, you know, we, we can clearly see that the ancestors of head lice and hominins and the closely related head lice of chimps diverged from each other around 6.1 million years ago or so. So that's you know well within the timestamp of the divergence of the hominin and chimp clades. So yeah, no surprises there, right? Um, after all, our hair is basically fur. So lice that evolved to live in that type of pelage could still hang on fairly well. 
But this doesn't tell us much about the loss of fur over the body. For that, we have to turn to the pubic lice. Now, human pubic lice share their closest living relative not with chimp lice, but with gorilla lice. Those two lineages diverged from each other only 3.3 million years ago, long after our common ancestor with gorillas. Of course, the question of how that particular transition happened is uh, another matter. Uh, there's all sorts of ideas about how that could have happened. Mm -hmm. But um, for now, you know, let's consider the basics. Gorilla pubic lice infest the same areas as human pubic lice do. But because gorilla fur is so prominent across the body, these insects can and do spread out far to other areas. So it can be safe to say that gorilla pubic lice should probably be called gorilla body lice instead. <laughs> now for human pubic lice, this can also be the case. And if you're not careful, they can spread to your armpits and your chest hair if it's particularly long, or your, your beard or your mustache if you have one. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> it's all pretty gross, I know, but it, it illustrates a point. Pubic lice can only survive on the furry parts of our body, and they like our general regions the most, which is now their own separate island of fur in a sea of thin, wispy hair. Mm -hmm. And so that means that the hominin lineage probably became furless sometime before 3.3 million years ago mm -hmm. in order for this sort of thing to occur. Right. And, you know, that has implications for how we choose to depict hominins in paleo art. You know, the possibility is strong now that species like Australopithecus africanus or perhaps the Paranthropus lineage may have even been as furless as us. Which, that's pretty cool to think about. Yeah. Um, but that now just leaves us with the question of skin color. To put it bluntly, were early hominins dark-skinned? Were they light-skinned? Were they somewhere in between? Or did they come in a whole bunch of different colors? Well, again, it's hard to say definitively. Uh, but we know that many different genes code for skin color in living humans. So we can study those and get some ideas. If you look at human groups today, all around the world, the sheer diversity of skin tones is astonishing, in my opinion. E even in Africa, where the genetic diversity of Homo sapiens is the highest, as you might expect, there we see a range of different skin color diversity. You know, the, there's really no such thing as a uh, average African person in this context. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's a whole a whole color canvas, if you will, uh, and, and much of the diversity in skin color is all down to climate. For species like us, having no fur on our bodies came with evolutionary trade-offs. You know, yes, we could get cooler faster, but now our body had a greater exposure to ultraviolet radiation from the sun. And there's also the matter of folate, or folic acid, which is a type of B vitamin that aids in reproduction by providing essential nutrients for fetuses, as well as vitamin D, which, as you might know, helps make us take in calcium along with other things for healthy bodies. Now, depending on where indigenous populations of humans have been in the world, their skin color became adapted to suit these particular needs. So dark skin provides and protects folic acid from the sun's rays and keeps it from breaking up while reducing the amount of vitamin D the body can use, but apparently not to levels that can greatly affect health. Whereas light skin is adapted towards taking in more vitamin D but not at the expense of losing the ability to, pr to protect folic acid. Mm -hmm. So in both these cases, there are balances that are struck. And it's no surprise that you tend to find dark-skinned indigenous populations in the equatorial tropics, and light-skinned indigenous populations in the more temperate to polar altitudes. You know, this is something that takes thousands to tens of thousands of years to evolve following these selection pressures, it turns out. So, you know, you won't find people immediately evolving these respective features when they move into a new place and climate. So, you know, all, all those British settlers in Australia, you know, they only arrived 300 years ago or so. They're not going to develop dark skin overnight. Mm -hmm. that's, that's just not how that works. <laughs> and on larger timescales, too, you know, that's why the Amerindian populations in the Amazon uh, haven't gotten as dark as Central Africans or Southeast Asians who have lived in their lands for far longer. You know, we're talking about 15 to 30,000 years in the Americas versus 55 to 300,000 years or so in Afro-Eurasia. Mm -hmm. Now, with all that explained, what sort of condition then do we think we'll find in early hominins? Well, 
Observing the signatures of various genes that code for skin color, the most likely hypothesis is that before we were furless, we had moderately dark skinned. Now, contrary to what you might have heard, no, chimpanzees are not white when you shave them. Mm. <laughs> you know, some folks really latch onto that, and I can probably guess why. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's actually a lot of variation in skin color among chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. But in general, a shaved chimp has fairly dark skin under all that fur. So it makes even more sense that early hominins would have been the same. Now, it's once the selection pressures for loss of fur kicked in by 3.3 million years ago or so, and once our lineage was expanding into newer and newer territory, then new selection pressures kicked in and you start to find populations of hominins with darker or lighter skin or even the same color of skin. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it's all very fascinating stuff. I, uh, I'll definitely talk more about this uh, later in the series as mm -hmm. there are a couple of neat studies to talk about, but uh, for now we have to move on. So let's jump to the next slide here. Uh, now, in the last episode, we looked at the recently discovered Lamechlian Toolkit and other related technologies that provided the first evidence that Australopithecine grade hominins made stone tools. Hmm. Now, while tools made from wood or other materials are not out of the question, it's the stone tools in particular that preserve the best and thus can give us the most information regarding tool use and hominins. And with the evolution of the genus Homo, stone tool manufacture just continued to give way to new forms. And the most widespread of these is what's known as the Old Awan Toolkit which is named after the Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. Now, from the 1930s onwards, the Leakey family, so we're talking about Lewis and Mary again, uh, they uncovered what were then the oldest known stone tools, which were eventually associated with Homo habilis and other related habilines. Now, the, uh, the Oldowan technology spans a period from 2.6 to 1.7 million years ago, and that's when the toolkit was eventually replaced by new reforms, whom we'll meet later on. Now, the change from the 3.3 million year old Lamechlian to the newer older one was very gradual. You know, those earlier stone tools consisted of simple cores or cobbles that had to be struck with other hammer stones. And the flakes would fall off and they left you a core with a sharp edge. And then both the flakes and the cores would have been equally useful for, mm -hmm. you know, cutting or digging at whatever you like. The older one tool kit took this general pattern and slightly updated it to include new tools. For example, now there were scrapers. So where the stone flakes had been worked on one side to produce a triangular knife that was sharp on all sides. Uh, but in principle, the, uh, the older one was nothing more than an enhanced system from what the Australopithecines used, which makes sense. Now, as you might guess, producing stone tools takes time and practice but also a rudimentary knowledge of geology. There are only a number of rock types that are malleable enough to be shaped. Mm. You know, when Old Awan tools are on Earth, they're almost always made from basalt, obsidian, mm. or quartz. And then there's the matter of understanding basic physics. You know, you, you can't just hit two rocks together and expect to make anything. You know, it's mm. all about the angle and the force of the blow on specific regions where the patterning on the rock is promising. And we recognize this thanks to years of trial and error to produce the same types of Oldowan tools by experimental archaeologists in order to learn something about their possible production. And you can kind of see the hints of this on the image on the left here. Uh, an individual who is practicing and learning a craft for the first time, it's been argued, can usually take anywhere from a few hours to a few weeks to perfect an Oldowan tool. Hmm. So, in, in the words of the anthropologist Augustine Fuentes, it's an art. So, we jump to the next slide here. Um, for the sake of completeness, I, I just want to give a, a brief overview of the other related stone tool kits, just to kind of hmm. show what we're dealing with here. Um, the old one itself had quite a range throughout Africa and across Eurasia, where it was further modified into regional variants, which you can see here. Now, uh, we've already talked a little bit about the 2.5 to 2.1 million year old tools that have been recently described in Algeria and Jordan and China, which demonstrate a early hominin presence in these regions. You know, just what form of Homo made these tools is an open question. 
But the researchers who described all of these note the similarities with the old one technology, um, which was made by Havoline grade hominins. So there's probably a link here. Uh, for example, the, the Chinese tools. Uh, so on the first column on the right, you can see them there. Uh, these were made of these same types of rocks as the old one. The, the people who made these were using quartz and basalt and obsidian. And the general shapes are the same too. We have cobbles, cores, we have scrapers, we have flakes, and we have hammer stones. Now the Jordan tools, shown at the bottom of the first column, they show the same pattern. Now the Algerian tools, so here we're at the upper left now, uh, they have been specifically described as Old Dewan tools. So there's really no ambiguity there. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that leaves us beyond a shadow of a doubt now that Havilines, moving across the Afro-Eurasian landmass, took their tool-making skills with them, and then adapted it to specific needs. Now, the remains of the enigmatic Homo Georgicus also came with stone tools, and these show an even greater degree of change from the older forms of the Old Dewan technology. For one, the types of rock chosen for tool manufacture were mostly different. Now, to supplement quartz and basalt rocks, Georgicus also used andesite, which is a, another type of volcanic rock, mm. and tuff, which you, if you remember from our discussion of the Latoli footprints, is rock that's made from volcanic ash. Now, the Caucasus region, where these humans lived, had been volcanically active for quite a while, so it was probably a good idea to make the most of it. Now, on the other point of distinction, it seems that Georgicus was not all that into using the flakes produced from the colliding of hammer stones onto cobblestones. Hmm. And instead, they were more focused on the cobbles themselves. You know, they would take the cobbles, and they would make these very messy-looking chopper tools. Now, why the shift to choppers more than flakes? Good question! <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it might all have to do with the types of food that were being acquired, which is a subject too that you know, we'll, we'll get to in a moment. Now, uh, lastly, there's the stone tool technology that Homo friesiensis and its possible ancestors were using on Flores. Now, researchers have noted that, even for their recent age, the tools look remarkably similar to the old one technology. You know, if they ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Um, well, that's only true in part, because Floresiensis did expand on the toolkit in a very important way. They were creating microblades and points. Mm. Now, that's very characteristic of a human using spears. Right. And it's very possible this species was using wood or uh, bamboo, you know, which grows on Flores, to construct spears that were situated with stone points at one end. You know, certainly would come in handy on an island full of tiny elephants and giant <laughs> lizards and birds. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, uh, given the poor preservation quality of plant-based materials, which is a general rule, you know, we have yet to find direct evidence of such spears. Um, however, the presence of, you know, these small handcrafted points and microblades, and that's not to mention the fact that they're actually polished in a way that shows that they were being used to shape wood, that's very telling. But such technology must have been used. You know, we, uh, we don't find small stone tools of this sort among the other old Dewan and related technologies, so... This may have been a local invention as Havilines began penetrating the tropical forests of Southeast Asia. You know, new territory requires new tools. Now, uh, let's jump to the next slide here. As I alluded to towards the end of the Australopithecine episode, stone tools appear to have been used in butchering animal carcasses. The sharp sides of the choppers and the pointed flakes would have been great for smashing open long bones to get at marrow, or cutting and scraping at the skin and ligaments to get at the meat. You know, early hominins might have preferred to collect the fat stores on dead animals mm. more than the muscle itself, but either of those would have provided really good sources of protein and energy. You know, that they did go after animal foods of this type is testified by the presence of cut marks on fossilized bones. You can mm. see I've highlighted some of these here. You know, the, the shape and the deepness of the marks directly matches that produced by stone tools. Again, we have the work of uh, experimental archaeologists to thank for this. So, it's clear that Havilines were omnivores. They were utilizing plant and insect foods, as well as meat and fat from larger animals. Now, regarding the question of how humans began to eat from such big meals, well, you know, the ideas proposed by Raymond Dart in the 1950s that we talked about, you know, killer apes being you know, brutal right. hunters and ripping apart their prey, that's no longer sound. 
But the jury is surprisingly still out on whether early hominins were capable of yeah. active hunting. You know, I, I admit the possibility is sound, but so far the evidence seems to be pointing in the direction of our ancestors starting out this diet by scavenging. Mm -hmm. You know, for one, we have no indication that the old one tools were being used to kill large prey animals. You know, I, I've actually seen paleo art of this <laughs> where you have these homo habilis ganging up on a big antelope and just mm -hmm. beating it to death with these choppers. You know, that, that, that seems very unrealistic to me. Mm -hmm. You know, javelins do not have the type of limb and body proportions for the type of running that is needed to catch up to such fast moving hoofed mammals. Right. You know, that would come later. So for now, scavenging carcasses would have been the most realistic option to acquiring red meat. Now, uh, finding a good carcass was another matter. Um, an abandoned carcass will likely be stripped to the bone of meat, leaving only the marrow as a last ditch, but still nutritious option. You know, this is known as passive scavenging. Whatever killed the animal was long gone, and you could just safely collect the food you want and scram. Hmm. Now, we know this type of behavior occurred because at some of the sites where stone tools have been found associated with dead animal bones, the bite marks of predators like big cats were overlaid by cut marks from stone tools. So that tells us that the animal that killed the prey fed and left, and then the human showed up to feast. Hmm. Now, if you want fresher, fuller meat, you had to get to a carcass that a predator had already brought down. But, you know, a, a saber-toothed cat or a hyena is not just going to let you sit down and share a lunch with it. <laughs> right. you, you got to find a way to get them to leave long enough for you to collect all the good stuff. Now, this is the notion behind power scavenging. Early humans already belonged to great communities that cared for each other. You know, we are primates after all. So it would have taken nothing to gather a big group together, grab whatever sticks or rocks that you find, and muscle your way up to a predator that had just finished bringing down game. Hmm. You, know, you, you get everybody to yell and scream, and you throw the rocks, smack the sticks around, whatever you can to just you know scare these predators off. And then you have this nice little window of time where you can quickly pull out your old one tools and collect as much meat and fat and marrow as you can, and then slip away with the prize before the predators get brave again. Mm -hmm. uh, but by then, you know, you're back home and this whole community can eat in peace. And again, the fossils reveal this activity too. Some of the later scavenges, uh, uh, some of the later carcasses in time show that the stone tool marks appear on the bones first, and then the predator's teeth marks sit above them. Mm. So that's very interesting. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, it seems like cheating, but it's effective nonetheless. <laughs> you know, it, it, this sort of behavior would have continued for generations and it would have had cascading effects on the local environment you know because now you have both the predators who have to adapt to their behavior to the new pressures of human hordes spoiling their kills right and the prey animals and how they behave in response to the predators responding to the humans right so already two million years ago and we're, we're seeing humans changing the overall environment <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, if anything, the predators at least got to have a little bit of revenge. So we turn back to our friends the parasites now, and we gain some interesting insights into the development of meat-eating behaviors in hominins. Genetic studies show that the kinds of tapeworms that humans get are most closely related to those of carnivorans, like mm. hyenas, hunting dogs, and big cats. And in fact, there's a record of two separate instances during our time as meat-eaters that uh, tapeworms began to inhabit our bodies by jumping ship from predators, you know, by sharing the meat from the same carcass. And if you know anything about tapeworms, you know this is a really rotten deal. <laughs> right. So uh, let's jump to the next slide now. Ah, admittedly, this is an aspect of human evolution that has become riddled with inaccuracy and myth. Right. I, uh, I think we focus so much on our big brains because as humans, we feel that this alone is what has helped us to become so smart and powerful. Right. You know, like the we developed such big brains because we got smart using tools and making fire and conquering predators, right? You know, that, that, that's the old story. Mm -hmm. um, but the situation regarding intelligence and the size of the brain is not as clear-cut as you might think. You know, it's not so much the size of the brain itself that is important, but rather its overall anatomy. 
uh, the proportion in relation to body size and how it's used in context with its surroundings. So think about insects like bees or ants or termites. You know, they don't have particularly grand brains for their body size like we do, but through this sort of collective eusocial behavior, they've developed a sort of intelligence that in many ways surpasses anything that we've achieved. I mean, in terms of organization and politics, at least. And uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it might be that social intelligence is the key to the observed expansion of the brain that we find in the hominin lineage. And so this chart that I've whipped up here, it measures the cranial capacity, that is the overall brain volume within the skull, for most of the known hominin species we've discussed up to this point, along with some related apes. So Pan here is the chimp genus. And the most obvious detail that you can see is that, in general, the genus Homo shows a notable spike in volume between 600 and 800 cc's, or cubic centimeters, uh, which has not been surpassed in the millions of years prior. Early hominins, including most of the Australopithecines, had a cranial capacity similar to that of living chimpanzees and bonobos, as well as a similar configuration of brain anatomy to those particular species. Mm -hmm. So a lot of researchers have argued that in terms of intelligence, the two are fairly similar. You know, Australopithecines were making stone tools and walking more bipedally, sure. But there is really nothing else to suggest that they were much different from the living great apes. Mm -hmm. Now, when we reach early humans, like Homo habilis, then we see some clear distinctions. Uh, the size of the neocortex, which is located uh, over the top of the brain, and it controls aspects of cognition. You know, that has grown significantly compared to earlier brains. Um, among living primates, there is a clear correlation between the dimensions of the neocortex and the nature of their sociality. In other words, the larger a primate social group, the larger the neocortex within those primates. And this has convinced many researchers that the habiline green hominins had begun to live in bigger social groups and interact with each other in more complex ways. You know, we see this clearly with the expansion of the brow ridge, allowing for new facial expressions. We see this in the evidence of compassion regarding the care for the injured Homo georgicus individual. Uh, we see this with the increased use of power scavenging, you know, recurring and requiring more teamwork to analyze the habits of predators and overpower them in order to gain food resources. Mm -hmm. And we see this in the growing use of the old Luan technology that was beginning to become specialized in various parts of the world. It may be that the size and shape of the brain grew and changed in order to better process these new, larger social conditions. Mm -hmm. Other researchers add additional factors into this. You know, the fact that more and more red meat was being consumed, which that provides more calories that could be used to feed a brain and, in a sense, make it grow. Now, these are, these are all important things to consider when thinking about brain evolution and hominins, uh, because it has become clear that the archaeological evidence is, is that is piling up and is showing that by the time the first true humans evolved you know they had grown uh, and gained a significant ability that remains unrivaled in nature so far as we know and for that we go to the next slide here now uh, i became familiar with the term collective learning from a historian david christian now, you might know him as the main founder of the the big history project Mm -hmm. um, I'm really drawn to the concept of big history. You know, it's this idea that you can synthesize all of the great fields of science and the humanities in order to ask large questions about the history of the entire cosmos, including mm -hmm. our place within it. You know, you know that particular concept did not originate with David Christian. It's been around since H.G. Wells and and beyond that. But you know, he was integral in giving it well one the big history name and then elevating it into popular culture. For example, the Crash Course series on YouTube, they did a whole thing on big history, which I highly recommend. Um, one of the concepts that he honed in on was the idea that collective learning marked a milestone in the history of life on Earth. You know, the first time that knowledge of any sort could not only be saved, but built upon and expanded. And that was achieved by the genus Homo. With the rise of social complexity within human groups, and I'm going to directly quote now from David Christian, People could share much more of what they learned with others. Thus, knowledge began to accumulate more rapidly than was lost. Instead of dying with each person or generation, the insights of individuals could be preserved for future generations. As a result, each generation inherited the accumulated knowledge 
of previous generations. And as the store of knowledge grew, later generations could use it to adapt to their environments in new ways. So, you know, humans are very good at working together. You know, you get enough of us together in a room and we can do whatever we set our minds to. You know, we're, we're creative primates. Through trial and error, we find ways to improve existing conditions, learn new things, and then pass that on to our offspring or to others in our community. And that's the key. As far as we can tell, Homo habilis, or Homo sediba, or any other related form, didn't have to continuously invent the old one toolkit. You know, once that technique was honed in, you could then take on the role of educator and teach others how to do it. And in time, they'll learn the ropes and become teachers for others. And for humans, you don't even have to necessarily participate in an activity to learn from it. So there was a remarkable 2015 study by E.E. E. Ect and colleagues who wanted to see if there was a correlation between stone tool making and the development of the brain. So we're going back to brains now. You know, did any parts light up when we were crafting these tools? So they got a bunch of students together to undergo this two-year training period on making all sorts of stone tool technologies, you know, including the older one as well as more recent types that we'll eventually need. And this involved direct teaching from expert tool makers but it also required the students to practice on their own time too, and then log about it in a book. Now, as this went on, the researchers would scan the students' brains and uh, see if there was any activity going on. And the long and short of it is, there were direct connections between the educational process of making stone tools and the parts of the brain associated with learning, planning, and communication. Hmm. You know, Give an early human community one or two million years of this, and you're highly likely to see massive changes to the brain's architecture. And indeed, this is what the authors of the study proposed. The gradual education process of making and using stone tools played a role in the remodeling of the hominin brain into a larger size, capable of processing even greater social functions. And as we've seen in the various toolkits around Afro-Eurasia, you know, with their own variations and themes based upon differing environmental factors, Collective learning played a huge role in the success of our lineage, spreading us far beyond our homeland. Now, because we could build on what we knew, any time we faced a new challenge, we had a necessary backlog of information to analyze and deal with it. And we didn't have to do it alone, because our communities had grown and were ready and willing to work together and to help each other. This was a large distinction in cognition between humans and the other primates. Study after study after study of primate behavior shows that multiple individuals, whether they're chimps or macaques or what have you, will only help each other if they are asked directly. You know, they might recognize the principles of fairness or generosity, but when it comes to empathy of a sort where you can visibly see when someone needs help, they come out short. Humans, on the other hand, you know, we bleed empathy. You know, we only have to look at somebody to know if something's up and then we'll spontaneously try to help in any way we can. And that's the key to the success of the genus Homo. You know, we took that with us across Africa and Eurasia, and it only grew from there. You know, collective learning really was a gateway into another world, a world where human cooperation and ingenuity could enact changes at higher and higher levels of organization, not just in our communities, but on the very landscapes we inhabit. You know, as we saw in our discussion of the extended evolutionary synthesis in the very first episode of this series, you know, organisms generally have the capacity to change their environments to suit their needs, even animals as small as worms or ants. But the degree to which humans do this is unparalleled, for better and for worse. Mm -hmm. Now, as you know, after the human genus evolved, you know, gaining the ability of collective learning, we were no longer on an equal playing field with other animals that we shared the world with. You know, our, our creativity, our power, and our cultural diversity were far larger than anything we know that had come before. And things only get more and more complex from there. And uh, with that, I think it's time to end the story for now. Um, Albert, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, not too much. Uh, I do think this is a, an extremely fascinating chapter uh, in human evolution. Um, yeah, just uh, kind of the origin of so many, I guess, stereotypically human traits and uh, the the story of the very complex spread of hominins outside of Africa. Um, it's a, 
yeah, it's it it's starting to get starting to feel really expansive and, and really big, I suppose. And uh, it's definitely been a, been really great to to hear about all of this from you. Oh, I'm glad. And I'm feeling it too. That's only going to grow from here. Um, mm -hmm. On the next slide, uh, let's see. Yep. So, excuse me. When we pick up the series again, you know, now we're going to enter the world of the aforementioned Homo erectus and its kin. You know, now we're reaching towards the middle of the Pleistocene epoch, where we enter a time when human activity was just only increasing on the Earth. You know, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to show you how humans mastered the plains through the final modernization of bipedalism mm -hmm. and using that to hunt big game for the first time. You know, we're going to look at the taming of fire, very infamous, and the further expansion on the human diet into new territories. And we're going to dig deeper into the mysteries of language, which is the next big leap in the process of collective learning. And so with that, we come to our acknowledgments. Of course, we want to thank Henry and Alicia for their contributions for the music and Albert's dinosaur color scheme, uh, respectively. And uh, I also want to give a special thanks to Matt Borths and Adam Pritchard, who run the Pastime Paleontology podcast. Uh, currently, they have 34 episodes. Uh, the last one uh, dealt with uh, collective behavior and trilobites and was really cool. You know, this this podcast dives into various topics within paleontology, uh, including paleoanthropology. Uh, in fact, it was their episode that they did on Homo floresiensis that uh, came back to my attention for this particular episode. Um, that graphic that you saw with all the different animal species, you know, I, I always loved that. And uh, I wanted to include it in this episode. And so I, I emailed them. And they were so gracious in giving us permission to use that image that, you know, they even send that to any of their uh, scientific graphics that they had made. You know, which is super sweet. And that's awesome yeah. of them. I, uh, so, you know, we want to give them a proper shout out here. Um, of course, we'll, we'll post a link to their podcast in the description. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if you want to follow them on social media, you know, they have a Twitter, at PastimePaleo. And, oh, that's paleo with the American spelling, by the way. So, 1A. Um, and they have a Facebook, too, as well. And uh, go check them out. And uh, with that, of course, we have our information. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter, at Time and Clades, uh, where we post updates. And, of course, as you're probably watching us on our YouTube page right now, through Time and Clades, where we currently have playlists for both of our respective series, Albert's and mine. Um, and if you have any questions for us about human origins or anything of particular interest, you can email us. We're, uh, <laughs> we're still waiting for our first question. <laughs> <laughs> we love to divulge, for sure. Um, and, of course, uh, in the YouTube description, we have the links to a reference page where, again, I have a huge list of resources that I've used if you want to dig deeper into the studies we've talked about today. Uh, and with that, um, Albert, what's next in store for us? Um, so I think we're going to do another bird episode next week. Um, so I'm going to be uh, introducing everyone to a group called Gruy Formies, and uh, they're the group that includes the cranes and rails. So a number of um, often water-associated omnivorous birds. Um, and in many ways, they are still very mysterious. So we're going we're gonna to delve into some of those mysteries next week. Oh, that sounds exciting. And we look forward to seeing you all then. But until then, have a great day, everybody. Take care.